Syracuse, Notre Dame inside the JMA Dome tomorrow. We'll talk about everything that pertains to this game. We'll get you set. We'll give you previews, takes, and, of course, predictions on Locked On Syracuse. It's right now. Our Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Matt Bonaparte, Owen Valentine, with you on your Friday episode of Locked On Syracuse. Thanks for making Locked On Syracuse your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. Uh, and today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, it's Syracuse, Notre Dame tomorrow. Like I said, sorry for the late pod today, by the way. Owen and I. Had a little bit of scheduling snafus, but we're here, and that's all that matters. And we're going to bring you some coverage on this game. If you don't listen to it today, hopefully you get to it tomorrow before Syracuse takes on the Irish. Um, just a little recap. Last time these two teams met was December 3rd of 2022, this season. Uh, Syracuse won that one 62-61. to 61. Main scores were Jesse Edwards and Joe Girard. Honestly, besides those two guys, if you'll remember, nobody else was all that spectacular. Those are the only two guys in double digits. They both had 20-plus. Judah was next up with nine points, and then all the way down to five for the next guy, which was Justin Taylor. So really a uh, lacking offensive performance for Syracuse in a game against a team that really did not match up well against them. Notre Dame does not have a big that can hang with Jesse Edwards. Uh, and he did have 22 points and 16 rebounds, an unreal game from Jesse. And we'll probably expect more. And something that we didn't see last time that I'll bet you we'll see this time is a guy named Malik Brown. He didn't play a single minute against Notre Dame last time. This time I bet you he does play as he has been on a rampage recently. His last two games, he has played 36 minutes and 34 minutes respectively, 10 points, 11 points. Uh, eight rebounds against Virginia, 12 for a double-double against a Virginia Tech. The guy has just been on a surge. We've been talking about him, and rightfully so. Uh, he'll definitely be making an impact. But, you know, I don't know if you're also on the Ken Palm page for Notre Dame, Owen. But they have been a team that has really not hit expectations this year. They came out hot, won five straight to start off the year. Uh, you know, against some pretty bad opponents, but still 5-0. and Then they lost to the Bonnies. Then they lost to Syracuse after a Michigan State win. You know, it's very interesting. They beat Michigan State, who is really good. Michigan State has been fantastic this year. Of course, it was a November victory, so uh, I don't know how much stock we're putting into those. But, uh, you know, still, um, they lose to Syracuse. Then they beat Boston University. Not Boston College, BU we're talking. Uh, and then the hugely underwhelming performance, uh, even within a couple more non-con games as well as the ACC. They just beat Georgia Tech by one point in overtime. That's what they're riding into this game in the Salt City. Owen, are you worried at all? I'm not worried. Um, I, I think this is a game that you got to be confident in. And regardless of, you know, struggles that Syracuse has had, this is a game you need to be confident. As a fan, as a player, as a coach, whatever – this is a, a game that you should feel confident that you can walk in, do the job, and walk out. And, and I think that that is exactly what is a fair reality for where this Notre Dame team is right now. They almost strike me, uh, just as you were talking through there, like it's a very similar trajectory to what Virginia Tech has done in terms of they had a really, really strong start to the sure. season. A couple of quality wins in there. You're like, okay, they're they're pretty good. And then you get into the ACC slate, and we talk about it all the time. Not an incredible ACC at the moment by any means. And they're getting torched in the ACC, right? I mean, Notre Dame just got their first conference victory against Georgia Tech. They were 0-5 in the conference before that. And they get a one-point overtime win um, at home against Georgia Tech, right? This is not a team that's 
great at the moment or in general, but they started pretty solid, especially, right? I remember we were previewing that first game and they're coming off a Michigan State win. And you're like, oh, okay. And I think that was the episode where I dropped the F-bomb uh, talking about one of their players uh, because that's how good that they looked at this point in time. And they really did have a strong start to the season. And I feel like them and Virginia Tech are very much, you know, mirrors of each other. And Virginia Tech, a slightly better team in reality, maybe a little more than slightly better. But right now they follow the same trajectory. And I think it's a really good matchup for Syracuse because of their being undersized and their not a lot of depth. I remember that first game, I think Syracuse got out-rebounded by six-ish, including double-digit offensive rebounds for Notre Dame. They scored almost 30% of their points on second-chance baskets. That is something Syracuse needs to crack down on. And I think, as you were mentioning, and sort of where you tossed it to me, I think that's a place where Malik Brown plays a massive, massive role in terms of minimizing their second-chance points because of his ability to rebound and his ability to defend and things like that. I think it's going to be a really good change for Syracuse in terms of an easy way to find even more success against Notre Dame the second time through. Yeah, and then one thing that I think we've all learned about Notre Dame at this point is that they play like six or seven guys. Um, They don't really run deep on the bench. The guys you see are the guys that are going to play. Uh, That's Nate Lashevsky who – Feels like he's been in college basketball for 25 years. Um, I feel like the ACC has a decent amount of those this season. This is his fifth year in college basketball. Um, And then J.J. Starling, who everybody in Syracuse thought that the Orange would have a chance at because he was from Baldwinsville, blah, blah, blah. Um, He is a Notre Dame fighting Irishman. Uh, And then Dane Goodwin, Cormac Ryan, Trey Wirtz are the rest. I mean, It's a very weird group because it's a bunch of seniors and then Starling, who's the true freshman, if you remember that. I remember we did this last time. Um, But, you know, they're a team that is that is still I mean, for a team that is so old and you think they'd have their chemistry together, there's they still don't have it together. Um, And they just can't quite figure out what they need to be on the floor. So, I mean, it's the third oldest team in college basketball. Wow. I didn't know that. That's pretty Ken crazy. Palm. I, I trust Ken Palm. I do. D1 experience. Wow. They are the third most experienced team in the country with an average D1 experience of 3.59 years. That is That's absurd. Nice. That is absurd. The next, uh, uh, only... Another thing, I want to throw this out there as well because we hit on it the first time through and I think it needs to be reemphasized yeah. and said again. It's very easy to say, oh, this team doesn't have depth. There's only They're only going to run six or seven. Get them in foul trouble, and you'll be fine. They don't get into foul trouble. All five of their starters average fewer than two and a half fouls committed per 40 minutes. They do not get into foul trouble. If you get a guy in foul trouble, yes, that's great. Obviously, it helps. But this is not like the, oh, they don't have depth. You're just going to be able to attack them. They're really, really good at not fouling, and they stay out of foul trouble and are still able to do okay defensively. They're not a great defensive team by any per, any you know stretch of the imagination, but they're able to do all right in some facets defensively. But one of the things that they struggle with in that, where you can take advantage in terms of Jesse and the interior, is they do let up pretty high percentage shots, and that's a, a number of different factors contributing to that. One of them being the lack of depth, so they're not going to play as physical. Another one, you know, as we continue to mention, they're not huge, right? They're going to be undersized compared to Jesse, and Jesse is going to have that advantage. So these are things that, as a Syracuse offense, you're going to have to be able to play into and take advantage of. And I think this is a game, and you really did see it effectively against Virginia Tech, where facilitating through Jesse is going to be massive. Jesse picked up six assists, I think, in that Virginia Tech game. Uh, Whatever it was, it was a career high in terms of assists for him. And that is because, you know, defenses aren't going to collapse on him because of his size, because of his ability to to torch you. And him being able to pass out of that, whether it's to Malik Brown or back out to Taylor on the three or back out to Gerard for three, whatever it might be, or just a quick 
you know, backdoor cut. If you get Jesse the ball in the high post, a backdoor cut from one of the wings is going to be really effective. So being able to do little things like that, I think it does all start through Jesse because of these factors that, you know, play against Notre Dame in terms of their size, in terms of the lack of depth. So you are going to be able to reap the benefits of that, but you are not really going to get them into foul trouble in doing so. So take advantage of it if you're Syracuse. And if you want a couple more stats in terms of uh, those bench minutes and whatnot, they they are dead last in the country. It's not like they're close or they just don't do it a lot. They are dead last behind Marshall, Delaware, Rice, and Santa Clara in terms of bench use. Uh, so, I mean, that's pretty nuts. And then back to the experience thing, uh, the only teams that have more experience than Notre Dame uh, are Purdue, Fort Wayne, and the Horizon League. And Penn State, um, those are the only teams that have more experience. So those guys, you know, they're out there, and they're going to be out there. Okay, let's take another quick break, or actually our first quick break. This one brought to you by Bet Online. Throw the overlay up there. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to basketball. It's all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, they've got those too. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. Okie doke. Matt Bonaparte, Owen Valentine with you on Lockdown Syracuse. Um, Yeah, this is an interesting game because Syracuse has just – um, one of, I think it might have been the first game they won all year that they weren't favored in. Is that true? I don't have the stat handy, but it sounds right. Let me look I mean, through if you and just see look, if anything. Like, they yeah. probably were favored in all of these games. Lehigh, Northeastern, Richmond, and all the other non-cons, sure. Notre Dame last time yeah. is the only one I'm actually questioning since they were on the road. Um, but BC, Louisville, and Virginia, or BC and Louisville at home, they are Louisville on the road, but still. It definitely feels like it could be the case. Uh, it would, as you said, it would only be the second if it was otherwise. Uh, I'm trying yeah. to go quickly to pull this up as we, right. as we well, talk briefly. Yeah, you don't have to. Um, I'm going to get it. So don't, okay. don't talk right now. Don't talk. I got it. Okay. okay. They won by one point. Were they favored? No. Ooh, they were big dogs. Notre Dame were six and a half point favorites. Wow. Not huge, but a bigger spread than I remembered that being. Okay, so that was then that Virginia Tech game, to my knowledge, was the only game this season they've won that they were not favored in. Uh, And they won it by 10. Should have won it by 13, really, but it was by 10. Notre Dame were six and a half point favorites. I meant Virginia Tech. My bad. Um, Virginia Tech. They. Well, I mean, I, I think back to the first time, you know, we're sort of filling here for you know, a little bit of a tangent. Oh. That first time they played Notre Dame, I mean, Oops. they were <laughs> horrid. They were horrid the first time they I played I just Notre realized Dame. that I got it wrong. Yeah, so, that's what I was trying yeah, to help So you that out. was the second game. That was the second okay, time. Okay, my yes. bad, my bad. I'm on, I'm on the train now, okay? I, I've go. got it. Listen, I'm not that the betting guy. That was the second guy. time. But the I'm first not the time they guys. played, I mean, you got to think the situation, right? They had a losing record when they were playing Notre Dame. And at that point in time, Notre Dame had only lost one game and was coming off a Michigan State win. So you were like, oh, all right, this is going to be not good for Syracuse. They just dropped to Bryant. They just looked like not a basketball team against Illinois. They lost in overtime to St. John's, right? This was terrible at the moment. They had a couple of okay, being a generous word, they had one okay win in overtime against Richmond. They were not a good team. Of course, they were dogs. Now that we're now that we're talking about it, it makes a ton of sense as to why they were getting six and a half. Um, but this is a game where I, I would assume it could easily be a flip spread this time around. Uh, the way Notre Dame has played since that matchup uh, and the recent relative success that Syracuse has faced so far uh, since that game. Yeah, um, and but well, the original thing I was going to say is that this is just a big prove-it game for Syracuse Um, because you're coming off that Virginia Tech win. You're getting people's hopes up a little bit. Um, You have a chance to, you know, get some momentum going into a really tough game against Miami in uh, Coral Gables. Uh, So is this going to be the kind of game where Syracuse goes back to being, oh, 
God, they can't win. Or do they, is this the game where we all go, okay, there might be something here. Um, so I honestly think that that is the, the kind of aura that will be around the dome because if they win by 20 or something, which they probably should, because Notre Dame isn't that good. And if Syracuse is going to go anywhere this season, that's about how good they should be. Maybe not 20, but by 10, um, that's, that, that's the question for me is, are they going to go in there and romp Notre Dame and say, listen, we are a really, really good team. Or are they going to play them really close? I mean, we, like we've talked about many times before on this podcast, Syracuse plays down or up to its competition. Wherever the competition competition is, Syracuse plays to it, um, and they like to play it close. So I don't know. That's going to be uh, that. That's the question looming in my head. Yeah, I mean, what team will show up? Is it going to be a team that you know continues to build off of the momentum from Virginia Tech and you know the the momentum that sort of started closing out the Virginia game? Can they continue to compound on this relative success and their their improvement and this better team that has been out there recently in terms of their ability to score, their slight improvements on the defensive side of the ball, just looking a little bit more comfortable in general. I, I think that, as you said, will show a ton. And it is there's a lot of these games this season where I feel like we've had this mentality of, all right, they're going to show us who they are today. And this is another one of those games where we've got this new sort of reshaped, remolded idea, but we're, let's say, I'll make a pottery reference here. Okay. We've, we've done the little spinny wheel thing. We've made our bowl. We got to throw it in the kiln, right? We've got this shaped idea with the clay of, all right, this team with Malik Brown playing a good amount of minutes and Justin Taylor being pretty effective off the bench and, you know, Joe, Jesse, Judah, all sort of scoring, getting their fill, being a little bit more efficient. We've got this idea that we've sort of molded right now, but we do need a little bit more in terms of throwing it in the kiln, letting it solidify, really, really becoming a nice piece of pottery. And and that's sort of where we stand right now. Like, is this just going to crumble, right? Sometimes you throw something in the kiln, there's an air pocket, that thing goes boom and absolutely explodes. And there is, and I don't want it to happen. I don't think it will happen, but I would be lying to you if I said there's no chance that they come out and they get torched in this game by a Notre Dame team who say comes out and does what they can do in terms of being really efficient from three. This Notre Dame team can light you up from three if you let them. There's a chance that happened. I would say that's you put the pot in the kiln and that thing went boom. But I do think a lot of us have this idea right now and we do need to see, is this correct or have we completely mistaken? And this is a game that albeit shouldn't really tell you a ton in terms of a regular uh, Syracuse basketball season, right? You're not typically looking at a Notre Dame basketball game, especially the way Notre Dame currently is. Uh, You shouldn't really be looking at a Notre Dame game saying, all right, this is going to tell you who Syracuse basketball is, but it really is going to solidify, you know, whether or not our recent thoughts on the improved Syracuse basketball team hold any ground and are warranted or should they just be thrown back aside and we need to take our step back once again all right it's time for predictions okay are you ready are you excited i'm always ready i'm always fired up i don't think we have a line do we so the line i'm just going to go off ken palm line here ken palm lines got it at seven and a half in terms of a a series actually six and a half for a syracuse win um so that's what we're going to be working off of an exact opposite from last time. Um, Ooh, that's what I said. Notre Dame. So uh, we're going to use that. And I'm going to start us off here. You, actually, you know what? I started last time and you got upset. So I'm going to let you go. Okay. I'm on the train right now. I'm on the train. I am ready to buy in. I want to buy in. I don't even want the negative thoughts that I just verbalized in my head. Get them out. They are. They're there. I won't lie. I can't get them <laughs> out. They're there. But I'm on the train. Okay, two, 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 two. The train. I think they win by fifteen. Wow, fifteen point win. I think this is a team right now that is built and has established this sort of newer identity, and they can come out and torch this Notre Dame team, who is not great, who is not good. They are not a really good team. And I think Syracuse, the way they've been playing with this newfound minutes rotation, will be able to capitalize on that. 
I will say this. Let me add a couple of unnecessary stats that will make me look Go really ahead, good man. or really bad. I think Malik Brown gets his second straight double-double in this game. I, I think that is that the type too. of game he can have and the impact that I think he will have in this game. Uh, I would look to Jesse because Jesse, if I remember, didn't he go nuts the first time they played? Let me see. Yeah, twenty-two and sixteen. Yeah, I mean Jesse went bonkers the first time that they played. I'm gonna say Jesse and Malik Brown will combine for twenty-five rebounds and twenty-five points in this game. Oh, actually, let's say thirty points, twenty-five rebounds between the two of them. That's how dominant that I think they can be against this undersized Notre Dame team that doesn't like to play physical, doesn't really want to play physical. Uh, I think those two can take advantage of it. And, yeah, I'm going to put it out there. Maybe I'll be wrong, but I got a really good feeling that I'm right. I like that from you. Uh, I'm going to take Syracuse in the points as well. I think they win this game big. Um, so I'm right there with you on that one because, like you said, I mean, this is kind of a match made in heaven for this Syracuse team. Maybe not for others that we've seen recently, but for this team, it's perfect. I mean, Notre Dame, first of all, like you said, they're just not all that good, and they also just don't have anything to protect against Jesse and Malik. So you're going to be looking for that all game, and then, of course, you have Judah and Joe at the top. Um, but it's also going to be really interesting to see what Bayheim does at the three this game. How much does Benny play? How much does Bell and, and Taylor play? What what does he do with Bell? I feel like we're also, we didn't really talk about this, but I feel like we're also at the Bell, um, I don't know. We've seen, we're at decision time for Bayheim. He needs to decide yeah. what he's going to do with Taylor, Bell, and Benny in the three spot. Um, even though Benny, I know, is a four, so don't come at me in the comments. I get that. I'm just saying. Um Okay, uh, I'm going to take, like I said, I'm going to take Syracuse in the points. Uh, I'd, I'd say 10-point win, 15, sure. Um, we're both on the train to toot. Uh, yeah. And, uh, Let me, yeah, I think there's a few questions, right? You sort of hinted at, at that there. But there are some questions in this game, definitely, in terms of rotation that I think we'll get a better idea of. I think a lot of us have sort of seen that John Bowles uh, – brief stint as uh he has 15 uh, seconds of fame uh, yeah I, I think that's faded out and that's not a knock to him necessarily but more a nod to Malik uh and the emergence that he's had and the consistency and being able to contribute a lot more offensively uh, but I think that John Bowles sort of phased out there is a lot regarding the forwards right now between Bell between Taylor between Benny between Malik what is this minutes distribution? And I do think, you know, I'm starting to see rumblings of it in our replies and our comments. There, there are going to be some big impacts on the inevitable minutes hit that Chris Bell presumably takes. Uh, and, and I know that people are thinking it. It might be warranted just the way the landscape of college basketball is right now. Uh, but there could be some major impact from this, uh, the hit that his minutes should, in theory, take, given how successful other forwards have been at this point. So something to keep an eye out on. And, you know, we'll see, right? This is this is a big moment. Maybe they announce a different starting five. I don't think that'll happen. But as we said, I'm looking at the minutes distribution, not necessarily who gets a star next to their name uh, in the box score. So, a lot to be said in this game, a lot to be proven for Syracuse in terms of are they what we now think this reshaped team is? What does this rotation look like? Can they go in, win a conference game at home that they're supposed to win, and maybe not be paranoid or cardiac cusing at the end and just have a comfortable victory? Uh, it was nice to see against Virginia Tech. It really was. And, and I hope that they, and I think that they can continue that momentum moving forward uh, because. I want to be optimistic, even if it's hopeless. I want to be optimistic and, and root for, obviously we're not going to not root for this team, but be able to, you know, passionately stand by this team and say, all right, let's go. Let's be what we can do and, and be bought in on a team like this. I will be watching this game. Is this after the Seahawks game? The Seahawks play at what, at four? Now I'm all over the place. Couldn't tell you. Um, 
Or are they the early game? I'm going to no figure idea. this out before we continue. They play at 430. So this will be conflicting time for Owen. So if you see a lot of cranky tweets, it's because the uh, the Niners Seahawks game went as oh, everybody Niners. thinks it will. It's actually uh, a horrible game for me. I hate both the teams. Eh, it's all right. Go Seahawks. No. Um, okay. That is it for today's episode of Locked On Syracuse. Thank you for making it your first listen every day. For your next, go check out Locked On College Basketball, the new pod on the block. Isaac Shad and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. I'm Matt Bonaparte. He's Owen Valentine. We'll see you Monday.